Good morning. I'm, I'm, I'm Steve Martyr, and I'm uh, very pleased to um, introduce this uh, lecture, which honors the memory of uh, Philip May, who was a really important figure in schizophrenia research, as well as in, in, in the history of this department and uh, institute. Uh, Phil was actually the, my mentor and the person who led many of us uh, who are now psychosis researchers to, to come to UCLA. Uh, in the 1960s, he did one of the pivotal studies uh, then at Camarillo State Hospital that kind of defined how we treat schizophrenia today. But more than that, he actually uh, developed clinical trials methodology for both psychopharmacological research as well as psychosocial research. And, and many of those are really research today. But the history of this department, uh, Phil was the clinical director of what was then the Neuropsychiatric Institute. In 1970, moved over to become the leader at what was then the Brentwood VA. And he was actually the individual who, who, who developed joint between uh, UC and, and the VA. So again, he's a very important figure in, in the history of this department. We're pleased to have uh, for this lecture an individual who's Eric Granholm, well known to UCLA. And also I think he honors the kind of very careful work on interventional research and its methodology that I, I think Phil pioneered. Uh, Eric got his master's and his uh, PhD uh, here at UCLA uh, under the tutelage of uh, the, the late uh, Michael Goldstein and by Bob Asarno. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, did his uh, postdoctoral work with uh, Bob. And I remember very fondly Eric's uh, work in the basement of building two towers. I still work. Uh, during those years, one of the, uh, well, following UC his, his term at UCLA, he went to San Diego, where he's currently a uh, professor of psychiatry at uh, UCSD. He's the uh, director, uh, he's the um, chair of, psycho of, of the psychology service at uh, at, at, at the VA in San Diego. And most recently, he's the uh, director of a new center on mental health innovations. One of the pleasures I've had, I, I think you get when you're kind of older, is you get to see the whole trajectory of careers of somebody of enormous promise who goes into the later stages of their career and becomes really a, a, an important figure, and that's exactly what Eric's become. Uh, when uh, he's one of the foremost advocates of uh, innovative psychosocial treatments for uh, psychosis uh, as well as Alzheimer's. Uh, he has uh, developed a, a method that he'll, he'll describe today of uh, cognitive uh, behavioral social skills training, which has been widely adapted and very carefully studied by uh, Eric and his colleagues. And he's also uh, been very innovative in his use of, of technology to uh, both deliver innovative treatments and to uh, study their effectiveness. So with that, let me introduce uh, Dr. Eric Granholm. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Get this over. Thank you, Steve. It's really an honor to be here. It's it's uh, as 
Steve mentioned, uh, a special honor since I came from here. So Michael and Steve, thank you so much for inviting me and in the Department of Psychiatry for having me. Uh, I graduated from UCLA with my PhD almost 30 years ago, and um, now I'm here doing grand rounds, which is pretty awesome. So, and I look around, I see you know everybody I worked with at the time and continue to do stuff with, and um, it's really special for me to be able to come up and do this. So I'm, I'm so happy that you in invited me. Um, I'm supposed to talk about my conflicts of interest. Um, we wrote this book, which is how to do CBSST, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, if you pick this book up and just read it to patients, you'd do high fidelity CBSST. It's a super practical approach. And I'd like to disclose if you really like CBSST and then go and buy the book because of this lecture, I will earn $3.56 for each of those purchases. But Guilford will make a lot more money. Um, I also do some workshops on this, so I make money from doing that, and I have no other um, conflicts of interest to disclose. By way of overview, um, uh, I'm going to talk about my academic journey because I got this detailed e email about how to do grand rounds here. It told me how many words to put in every slide and exactly what I'm supposed to talk about. And personal academic journey was on there, which is perfect for me here because I'm going to talk about my UCLA roots. And then I'm going to tell you about CBS for negative symptoms and functioning in people who have schizophrenia. And then I'm going to talk about newer work I've been doing, which is blended care and very exciting movement in psychosocial interventions for serious mental illness and for all mental illness, um, which is combining these um, smartphone interventions, essentially, with in-person interventions um, to help people with uh, serious mental illness. So the fun part is my academic journey. This is Bob Asarno. This is me, and let me just tell you, in the 90s or 80s, you were really cool if you looked like this <laughs> and had a mustache and glasses like that. Bob taught me how to do cognitive neuropsychology re research in schizophrenia and pupillometry. And this is Mike Goldstein, who has since passed, but I learned about how to do family therapy from him up in Franz Hall in the psychology department. They were my dissertation chairs. Here's my committee, Bob, Mike, Bob Bjork, there's Keith Nectarline, and that's Jack Beatty, who does pupillometry. He's a cognitive uh, memory researcher. I think you know Keith. And if you, don't, if, you, if you have students, tell them to take a picture of their dissertation committee right before, the, before they defend, right there. <laughs> and it was so long ago, you can see I used the slide deck. I don't know if you remember, you used to have to take pictures of your slides and put them in a slide projector. <laughs> I am really old. Um, then I did a postdoc in Bob's lab. I stayed on for uh, a year or more, and Bob got interested in something called pupillometry. And he said, hey, be my postdoc and set up pupillometry in my lab. And I said, why? Uh, what do you do pupillometry for? But it, it's a device which is basically a video camera sensitive to infrared light while you look at things and do cognitive tasks. Or there's a handheld newer device, you just like a remote you hold up to someone's eye this is a Toby device where you don't have to be in a chin rest anymore. But you can just measure pupil's pupil diameter 60 times a second using any of these devices. And why would you do this? Because your pupil gets larger, the more effortful processing you do. So your pupil gets bigger, the harder you work on tasks. If you remember six numbers, it's your pupil's bigger at the end of that than if you remember, try to remember three numbers. So it's a measure of cognitive effort. So what's cool about this is it's an objective measure of how much effort someone's putting into doing something. So it's a biomarker of effort. You don't say, did you try hard? And then they say, yeah. You can actually measure how hard someone's trying to do a task, how much cognitive effort. And you can get at motivation and negative symptoms. And I'm telling you a little bit about this now, because toward the end, I'll tell you more about this. And this is Steve Martyr. As he said, I did my dissertation in the basement of Building 210 over at the VA, collected all my data from people going through his clinical trials. Um, Mike taught me how to do family uh, clinical trials research at the FAM Proj. And then um, I also ran into a lot of Bob Liverman's people doing social skills training over at uh, the basement there, uh, teaching patients with schizophrenia how to do communication skills and things. So I learned a lot about clinical trials research here at UCLA too. And then this guy, Joel Swenson, uh, called me up one day. He was a grad student at UCLA in clinical psychology one year behind me. And he, he called me up one day and said, hey, um, I don't know if you remember me, but I used to go to UCLA with you and I do smartphone technology 
and I do ecological momentary assessment. And I live in France now because I married a French woman and I'm in Bordeaux and I really like going to California. You probably really like coming to France, so we should do EMA together. <laughs> and I'm like, that sounds good. What's EMA? And so that's literally how I got involved in EMA and using smartphones. And that was a while back. But the moral of a lot of these stories uh, is that all the research I'm going to tell you about today literally comes from UCLA roots. Um, and um, one of the things I learned going through this, um, if, if you're in training and people make you an offer, just say yes. It's not like Nancy Reagan, just say no. Just say yes, because cool things can come from it. Before I came here, I was a neuropsychologist doing Alzheimer's research and neuropsychology with Nelson Butters, and I got into UCLA, the number one PhD program in clinical psychology, and the training grant was in schizophrenia. And I said, well, I really want to go to UCLA. Can I do neuropsych of schizophrenia? And Mike said, yes. I said, all right, I'll come. And I fell in love with doing schizophrenia. Now, I still do some Alzheimer's and some schizophrenia, but just say yes to pupillometry or EMA or schizophrenia, and cool things come from it um, if you're open to try them. So that's my brief academic journey. I can check that box from the email I got about what I'm supposed to talk about. Um, so as you know, that schizophrenia is a devastating illness. It affects 1% of the world population. It's incredibly expensive. Most of the cost of schizophrenia, monetary cost, is indirect cost from people not being able to work and maintain their own homes. So it's about disability mostly. And the cause of that disability, a big cause of that disability, is negative symptoms, especially motivation and social interest uh, or social disinterest, um, which are called experiential negative symptoms, uh, things that people experience, lack of motivation and lack of interest in engaging in society and social interactions. And this is a significant unmet treatment need. Medications don't work so well on this, and most psychosocial interventions are struggling to um, uh, target and improve negative symptoms in schizophrenia. That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and I'm going to start with what are the models of negative symptoms and how do we talk and then get to how do you target what causes negative symptoms in a therapy. And if you fall asleep now, remember defeatist performance beliefs are what you target in psychotherapy. And these are things that are you can target. If you've ever done cognitive behavioral therapy for anything, you know how to target defeatist performance beliefs. It doesn't matter if the person has schizophrenia or not, you can do therapy to improve someone's negative symptoms, and if you improve their negative symptoms, you'll probably improve their functioning. So here is um, the model of cognitive functioning. I'm um, um, the model of functioning in schizophrenia. This was the initial model. It's a simple model, <laughs> basically, that your brain causes you to function or not. This is a model we worked with for many years. Michael Green put this model forth. It's brilliant. Uh, <laughs> it's really the American biological psychiatry model. And it is true, your cognitive abilities, remembering things, problem solving, paying attention, impacts how well you function. People with higher IQs go further in school. Your brain matters. Your cognitive abilities matter. You'll go further in life with a good brain. We then learn that things come between the brain and your functioning, like social cognition, which are still in the ability realm. Things like being able to read affect on someone's face and, and tell if they're happy or sad. Being able to tip, put yourself in someone's position and think, well, that's what their intentions are, which is theory of mind. So these abilities, you can think, clearly would impact your functioning, and you need these basic abilities to have those. And then if you have a lot of good abilities, you can learn how to do stuff. So, your capacity to do things can grow. If you can remember and learn more, you can learn how to shop, you can use an ATM, you can develop skills and social skills, like how to communicate and ask girls out on dates and things, and that will improve your functioning. So that was the model for a long time, and all those things um, do contribute to functioning. But then along came uh, Aaron Beck and Paul Grant and Neil Rector, and they said, hey, what you think matters as well. So cognitions, not neurocognitions, but thoughts, like defeatist beliefs or social appraisals, like, 
hanging out with people isn't fun. That's an appraisal of socializing. It won't be fun. Or I'm not going to apply for that job because I'll get I'll have to go back in the hospital or they'll never hire me. I won't or ask I won't ask her out because she'll say no. These are thoughts people have that will drive whether they're motivated um, to do things. And that motivation will drive whether you actually do things. So I don't know if anybody recognizes this part of the figure. What is that? Nobody knows what that is? It's the cognitive triad. It's a generic cognitive model that thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are related. It's what drives CBT. It's what makes up who we are. It's not a model of disease. It's a model of people. People are thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And what you think drives how you feel and what you do. And so if you think nothing will ever change, you're sad and pessimistic, and you stay home and do nothing. So this is the cognitive model of negative symptoms and functioning in schizophrenia. So to drill down a little bit, if you grow up and you have uh, a lot of failure experiences caused by having schizophrenia, being stigmatized for having schizophrenia, internalizing that stigma, I have schizophrenia, I can't do anything, my doctor told me not to work because I'll end up in the hospital, all these kinds of things will drive you um, to have defeatist beliefs. And if you have cognitive impairments, like if you can't remember things or do things well, you're not going to get good grades in school. Maybe all these things lead you to not have a lot of friends or ever have a girlfriend. You're going to start to think, I'm damaged. Why try? Why bother? Not worth it. These are defeatist attitudes. Remember, I told you, remember defeatist attitudes. And that's going to lead to experiential negative think symptoms. If you think these things, you're not going to be very interested in trying things, and then you're not going to do them. So your goal-directed task behaviors aren't going to be, you're not going to take it, you're not going to engage. So the idea is if you can challenge these defeatist beliefs, you could improve motivation and improve functioning. This is basically the Beck model of negative symptoms and functioning in schizophrenia. It's the CBT model. Turns out you can measure these defeatist performance attitudes. If you can't do something well, there's no point in doing it at all. If I fail partly, it's a, I'm a complete failure. These kind of attitudes are belie generalized beliefs about not being good at stuff and not being able to perform things. There's a 15-item scale you can administer to measure that. People have done that in 18 studies, um, summarizing this Tim Campaleone and Kring students' meta-analysis of these associations, and you find um, medium kinds of correlations between greater negative symptoms with more severe defeatist attitudes and poor community functioning with more severe defeatist attitudes. Um, Michael did this paper, which was in archives, I guess now JAMA Psychiatry, um, which validated, uh, in this case, as I think this is structural equation modeling, um, early visual perception, so cognitive abilities lead to social cognitive abilities, which lead to these attitudes and the A motivation and poor outcome. So you go from abilities through beliefs to motivation to outcome. We did a similar thing with a, a graduate student, Tom Quinlan, uh, and I, where we gave the MCCB, a neurocognition battery for schizophrenia, the DPOS, we measured with the SANS these motivation and social negative symptoms and functioning on a self-reported independent living scale. And this is a measure of functional capacity, specific social, in this case, social capacity. It's a role play that you do with people called the Maryland Assessment of Social Com Competence. It's just how well do you make eye contact and communicate. And we found two paths. Once you put capacity in the model, you find two paths that fit best, where you go through attitudes to motivation and functioning, and this path goes just straight through capacity to functioning. So the idea still is abilities, skills, beliefs, and motivation get you to functioning. So to summarize what I've said so far, both abilities and skills deficits contributed to poor functioning in schizophrenia. And consistent with the CBT model, defeatist beliefs contribute to low motivation and get you to functioning as well. Therefore, if you develop an intervention that teaches skills and modifies beliefs to improve motivation, you might be able to improve functioning. So now I'm going to, that's the model. 
Um, and now I'm going to tell you about evidence for interventions that target those things in order to improve functioning. CBT, SST, CVSST, and once again, I'm going to try to convince you that defeatist beliefs are the mediator and the target a good target mechanism. In case you didn't know, there are many psychosocial interventions that are recommended for people with schizophrenia. Um, in many treatment guidelines, the patient outcomes research research team is an NIMH committee that recommends, the American Psychiatric, all nationalized healthcare systems in the UK, Canada, Amsterdam, you know, the Netherlands, and the VA, which is our nationalized healthcare system in America, all mandate these psychosocial interventions for people with schizophrenia. So supported employment, sort of community treatment, education, family therapy, and what I'm going to tell you about social skills training and CBT are all in treatment guidelines around the world. If you come in and to UK and you have a first episode of psychosis, you have to be offered CBT, for example. So why is this? There's tons of evidence that these things work. This is the first meta-analysis by Till Wikes over 10 years ago now, 33 studies of CBT targeting psychosis. Now these studies are targeting hallucinations and delusions primarily, not defeatist attitudes or negative symptoms or functioning. But they're finding changes across the board in many outcomes at about a medium, almost a medium effect size. I'm not, for time, I'm not going to show you the eight or 10 other meta-analyses. There's now been about 75 clinical trials of CBT for psychosis, and some do target negative symptoms, and some target other things like social anxiety and things. Um, and you see similar effect sizes to this, although as the, as the meta-analyses go on, the effect sizes go down because people start using more active controls as opposed to treatment as usual. They get more rigorous. Whenever you do that, effect sizes go down. So they drop to closer to 0.3 in more recent meta-analyses. Social skills training. Here's a meta-analysis by Kim Muser um, with 22 RCTs. Look at this effect size, 1.2. That's enormous. Um, and, uh, but so people, that's for content mastery. So people can learn stuff in CBS, in SST. They can learn how to do skills but it doesn't generalize to what they are. It does generalize to what they do in the real world, but with only like about half the effect size. So people learn skills, but they don't use them to change their life as much. But still, you get a medium effect size about 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Does anybody know what the effect size for antipsychotic medications for positive symptoms is in schizophrenia? Steve, you might know. About 0.4, right. So. Remember, everybody in, um, especially these trials that targeted positive symptoms, um, everyone in these trials are already on medication. So this is the additional bump in symptom remission after, in someone who's already on medications. You get another 0.4 out of it. You can kind of think about it that way. It's not totally legit. but So to summarize, you get significant but modest effects of CBT and SST on negative symptoms and functioning. Defeatist beliefs and skills deficits both contribute to poor functioning. So my logic is, well, what if you combine CBT and SST? Sometimes people learn the skills a lot, but they don't use them. So that's why we combine. People have the skills, but don't use them. It's often because a thought is in the way. Um, I started doing CBSST because I learned how to do social skills training. I was very behavioral with Bob Liberman and even behavioral family therapy with Mike Goldstein. In my clinic, it was a dual diagnosis clinic, I'd role play, teach people to ask girls out on dates, for example, because they want to get a, a girlfriend. And then when they're faced with a real girl, they don't ask her out. They did it great with me. Hi, Eric, would you like to go on a date with me? They'd call me Mary or something. But they did it great, but they didn't. Why didn't they do it? Because of a defeatist belief. She might say no. She might laugh. You know, what would that mean about me? I'm damaged by illness and I'm unlovable. People can't, won't date me. So you could have all the skills and teach all the skills you want, but if you don't address the thoughts that are in the way, people aren't going to do it. And so that's why we combine CBT and SST. What is it? It's three modules, cognitive skills, social skills, and we also added problem solving skills. So we challenge thoughts and do experiments to test out beliefs, defeatist beliefs mostly, 
And then we teach communication skills by doing role plays, um, just like Alan Bellack's book. In fact, we stole the four basic communication skills from Bellack and Muser and Gingrich's book. We teach how to do communication skills toward goals. It's very goal oriented. If you want a job, you're role playing how to do an interview. If you want your own apartment, you're role playing how to get along with roommates. If you want a girlfriend, you're rolling, role playing how to date and how to ask people out or make a friend. And you're getting thoughts in the way of using those skills. And then you're problem solving how to go and where can I meet people? Where, where can I find out about rents? So you do systematic five-step problem solving training. We use a lot of acronyms like three C's and scales to te teach things. This is specify, compile alternative, assess the best one, lay out a plan execute and evaluate. It's standard five-step problem-solving training if you know about that. So the big thing we use is the three C's. Catch it, check it, change it. Okay, it's a mnemonic aid to remember. Catch your thoughts. If it's not helping me get the goal, check it out. What's the evidence for or against? Is it a common mistake in thinking? Like all or none or jumping to conclusions? And if it is, just change it to another one. Patients remember this, they love it. Um, Often in groups, I'll say, what are the three C's? Oh, three C's, catch it, check it, change it. What's it? Crickets. Someone forget it's a thought. People catch, check, and change feelings. So you practice it. It's a skill, like riding a bike. And eventually, people can do it. You do thought records. If you're home alone thinking about money and you want to get a job, you have these feelings and you don't do anything, that's a red flag to do the three C's. What are you thinking? They'll never hire me. I'm not good enough. Write down the thought. What's the evidence for it? Oh, I'm predicting the future. That's a mistake in thinking. How do I know they won't hire me? I used to work. And then change it to a thought that might be more helpful, right? This is just common sense kind of stuff, right? It's just capturing defeatist attitudes, changing them to motivate people to go and try to do their functioning goal. We're targeting functioning here. This has gone viral. I get emails all the time about the three C's from around the country, around the world. This, got sent to, this was sent to me from a patient who drew it. They had an art contest at their VA about you, what draw a picture of the th catch it, check it, change it, three C's. This was a wallet card. Um, and the best one I got was this song sent to me. This is, a, this is a song, Catch It, to the tune Whip It by Devo. When you stop working on your goals, you must catch it. When you're feeling really bad, you must catch it. Now check it. Is it true? Look for facts. Check for clues. And I'm not going to sing anymore, which I'm sure you're happy about. Yikes. OK. I hope I'm not going too fast, because I still have a lot to say. But um, so that's what CBSST is. We've done a bunch of clinical trials of CBSST. We've actually done like six of them now, two of them I'm still writing up, but we, we randomized people to different conditions, treatment as usual, or what we call goal-focused supportive contact, which is an aggressive goal, functional goal-setting intervention with long-term goals, short-term goals, goal steps. The group gets together and works on functioning goals. It's not just supportive contact versus CBSST. Well, what happened in these trials? This was the first one we did where we compared CBSST to nothing, treatment as usual. And in all these slides with functioning, the measure we use is the independent living skills scale, which was developed here by Chuck Wallace. Um, and it's a self-report scale. About, it's about 50 yes, no questions. Did you go on the bus? Did you call someone? Did you do your laundry? Did you take a shower? Did you do a work? Did you go to school? A whole bunch of things. It's yes, no. In the last month, did you do any of these functioning things? And, uh, and so we compared CBSST to treatment, as, to treatment as usual, and CBSST did better. This is the same thing on the same scale, but now it's toward an active control, the go-focus supportive contact. Same scale, the ILSS. Treatment ended here, and look at, we get a nice big effect size out later on, um, where CBSST is doing better for this functioning measure relative to goal-focused supportive contact. This is negative symptoms. So this is the SANS diminished motivation factor, which is experiential negative symptoms of amotivation and asociality. Um, down is better, so symptoms go away in CBSST. They actually get a little worse in um, goal-focused supportive contact with a nice effect size out at one-year follow-up. 
This is defeatist attitudes. So this is all the deep, that DPoS scale I showed you. In, in CBSST, those attitudes become less and less severe and they don't really change in goal focused supportive contact. So when you target these beliefs, they get better with a nice effect size a year after therapy ended. Um, that's an interesting point I always like to make at Grand Rounds is um, notice how they continue to get better. If you look at past end of treatment, if people, if you teach people skills and they keep using them, they keep getting better. So the idea is you're putting something in a patient's toolkit that they can take away with them and continue to improve their life. Um, and that's why in psychosocial clinical trials, it's kind of a double standard compared to med trials. In a med trial, if you give someone a medication, they get better and you take away the medication and they get worse, that proves the medication worked. If you give someone a therapy and they get better and you take away the therapy and they get worse, that proves the therapy didn't work. It proves you just have to hang out with a the therapist all the time. And there, you know, that might not be a bad idea all the time. Some people think it's a good idea that you be in therapy forever. And if you stay in that therapy, you probably won't get worse again. But if you teach people skills, we find that you continue to get better and you don't have to be in therapy forever. Defeatist beliefs mediate the effect of CBSST on motivation and functioning. So we did some bootstrapping and mediation uh, analyses, um, but not functioning, I'm sorry. What we find is that the therapy group changed defeatist beliefs, which then changed motivation. Um, but we didn't find a significant path here through defeatist beliefs to functioning. So this is kind of consistent with our model that defeatist beliefs are more proximal to motivation, whereas functioning is more downstream and other factors are gonna influence your functioning besides just your motivation. For example, economics and whether you can get an apartment if that's your goal. Um, some things that you wanna do for functioning are in the, have to do with more than just your motivation. Um, but beliefs are right next to motivation and are going to have a greater impact on your negative symptoms than further downstream. And I think a lot of the literature suggests that the relationship between beliefs and motivation is stronger than between beliefs and functioning. So, what have I told you so far? CBSST works better than treatment as usual or an active control to improve functioning, negative symptoms some signal on that. And our effect sizes were bigger than we saw in either intervention alone. So bundling might help more than giving either one alone. And defeatist beliefs, again, was we found evidence that that was the, a good target uh, to lead to the improvements. So at this point, I'm going to stop talking about CVSST intervention and talk a little bit more about a little bit about apps and um, MH Tech. We have an MH Tech Center in San Diego now that we're trying to build. Um, and my personal uh, opinion is that combining face-to-face -face with digital interventions is um, a good way to go, as opposed to just giving someone an app, an app and having no face-to-face -face contact with them. Um, if you want to change something like functioning and negative motivation, um, I think it takes a little bit more than just an app, but maybe we just haven't developed the right app. <laughs> but we're having more success with a little more contact and therapy and adding an app. Um, CBSST in those trials I showed you, a lot of the number of sessions was 36 sessions. So people came in for weekly therapy for nine months. All right. We were getting nice change and actually some of the how many sessions does it take analyses we did suggested 18 was a good amount, 24 was a good amount. But we're trying to figure out how can you reduce burden on systems and providers by not having someone have to come in for therapy for nine months in order to improve these hard to move outcomes. So maybe if you add an app, you could strengthen the intervention. I mean. Just in a simple way, if the app makes people practice the skills more in the real world or do their homework, you think you'd get more bang for your buck because they're just doing the skills more. If you practice the guitar in between your guitar lessons, you'll learn it faster than if you only practice during your guitar lessons. So if all an app does is that, it should strengthen the intervention, right? So I think blended care is what they're calling this now in the literature is a good way to go, in person and app. But these phones have tremendous potential, as yet unrealized, but 
tons of potential. You can measure a ton of things and get digital phenotypes and maybe where someone is and how active or sleep, much sleep they have or what they're reporting on surveys every day might give you some good idea when and how and intervene right on the phone so you could do real-time interventions. You can measure cognitive abilities in, in the wild um, and push out all these surveys where you can assess lots of things on these phones and you could use that in a lot of ways. You could just imagine uh, ways you could strengthen an intervention with all the things you could just get off a phone and then push out to people on a phone with just a server. I'm going to tell you about one example of this. Um, I only have time really for one. We've done a bunch of studies on this, but this is the newest one and it ties in with the defeatist attitudes story I've been telling you. Um, we call this intervention mobile assisted CBT for negative symptoms. In a nutshell, it really goes after these Everything goes after defeatist attitudes. It's sort of an unbundling of CVSST. People ask me, well, do you think it's the role plays or the CBT that's working? And I've never done a dismantling in a study, but this is just the cognitive skills, really. There's no role plays, there's no problem solving. It's just pounding away at defeatist attitudes with the app and with the intervention. So we did what Steve Martyr told us to do in the matrix, NIMH matrix committee on how to do studies for negative symptoms. And we enrolled people with persistent negative symptoms. This means they have to have high negative symptoms for a two to four week run-in period where they persist over that period. And then they can come into the trial. They also can't have po severe positive symptoms. They can't have depression. So in other words, their negative symptoms can't be secondary to other causes. So people who are depressed might not have high motivation. People who have high paranoia might not want to go out and have low motivation, but it's because they're scared to go out. They think they're going to be harmed. So if you exclude people with high paranoia, high disorganization, high hallucinations, high depression, even high medication side effects, you're presumably getting primary negative symptom patients in there. So if you enroll only those patients, and you now are on firmer ground to say, my treatment treats negative symptoms. A lot of those other trials I showed you, like the CBT ones that changed negative symptoms, they changed positive symptoms. They were targeting positive symptoms, but negative symptoms also changed. But maybe people got less anxious, less scared. Their voices didn't tell them not to go out, so they started going out. You don't really know if you change negative symptoms or if the change was secondary to the change in these other things. So you have to do this nasty study, which I recommend no one do, which is only enroll this special kind of patient. Because we consented 67 patients and only 46 of them made it through that run-in period where they met all those criteria that I told you about. It's a hard study to do. Plus, by the way, you're picking, we pick people with experiential negative symptoms. So they're by definition unmotivated to come into my therapy groups every week. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what we want to do. Let's study them. Um, but we drove them. I really recommend you do this, get a driver. I've done this in all my studies. Every study I've driven people, I have retention rates above 80, 85%. Every study I haven't driven people, my retention rates are below 70%. And it doesn't matter if it was a negative symptom study or not. In San Diego, where there's no transportation system, if you go pick people up, they come in. If you don't, they don't. Um, and then we did 90 minute groups for 24 weeks and we did this app I'll tell you about. We gave them a fully functioning iPhone 6, which is pretty cool. Like my kids are like, I want an iPhone 6. Um, and it had unlimited text data, had everything. Was, and we assessed at multiple times to figure out what's a good dose. Like could we get away with short, shorter therapies if it's, the phone makes it stronger? So we just did an open, this is just an open trial. We just enrolled those people into one group. There's no control group. We just want to see if the app could change these targets and what dose would be good. Um, this is part of the experimental therapeutics program at NIMH. If you haven't looked into this R61, R33 grant mechanism, it's, it's wonderful. I highly recommend it. This is the open trial phase of that mechanism. So we made this app, and I love this uh, icon. We trademarked it. This is the library at UCSD. That's our logo. It looks like his brain. See that? It's pretty cool. CBT to go. And what does the app do? It challenges defeatist attitudes. You set recovery goals. It does pleasure savoring and pleasant activity scheduling. It promotes socialization. It prompts homework adherence. And it prompts activities in general. So what does it do? 
Each day they get this screen would pop up in the morning and say, uh, what do you want to do today? An activity, a pleasurable activity? Do you want to set a goal step? Do you want to do your homework or take the day off? Whatever they pick decides what happens. So if they pick pleasure, it has this pleasurable activity app. If they pick that, they enter these things like I want to go to the movies or go to the beach. And if they do it, it gets checked off. You can add an activity. And this is what happens in the pleasurable activity screen, which is they rate how much pleasure they anticipate the activity being, and then afterwards they rate how much pleasure it was, and then the, you can use those data to say, hey, things are more fun than you thought they were. That's combating a defeatist attitude that things aren't fun. They can journal about how it was. You can take a selfie or a picture and save it in the app. You can put music in there. Anything that helps remind you of how much pleasure you got in the activity. Because people with schizophrenia enjoy things just as much, but they don't anticipate enjoying them as much as other people. So you want to change their expectations that things can be super fun. And, and one way to do that is to remind them, hey, when you went, did it before, it was fun. There's a goal setting app where you set a goal to have, like in this case, a long-term goal to have a romantic partner, short-term goals to improve your conversations, um, look my best, and then goal steps like list things to talk about to improve the conversations. And so the app systematically helps them break big long-term goals into things that you can do every day to achieve the goal. This is hard to get them to do on their own. The therapists often help fill this in. But this app can pop up and say, here's something you can do today to help get your goal. So to walk you through it, here's a pleasurable activity example. If they pick that, it says on a scale to one to seven, how much motivation, success, or pleasure so we're sampling defeatist attitudes here. How much fun do you think it's gonna be? And then they set a time when they're gonna do it and the app will remind them to do it. And, and if they rate this as a two, so here's, they're saying two, uh, it's not gonna work out so good. If they rate this low, this screen says, challenges the thought, it does CBT. So this says, but you said playing cards with Joe at the clubhouse is fun. Things, it'll say some personal thing about things are more fun than you, you than you're saying they are. If they say this is a seven, then it says, great, things are really fun. If you, if you go and you should go do fun things. So it reinforces, but if they say a defeatist belief, it challenges. And then now go to the pleasurable app and do it. And then we have this to promote engagement. They spin this wheel, it goes tick, 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 stops on the diamonds. They can get a hundred diamonds. These are just points. And they're like, oh, I got a lot of points. And it keeps track of how many points they're getting ever and this week. So the therapist pulls this screen up in group and they also have a dashboard and they can say, oh, you didn't do any of your activities this week. Why not? What got in the way? Oh, I don't know how to charge my phone. Oh, let's go over that. Or it says you can have, we have raffles and tickets and things that say, oh, you have the most points in the group. You get to pick from the bin today. So there's, you have to build in these engagement reward things, gamify it a little to promote engagement. So what happened? Uh, with the group at 12 week, 18 week, and 24 weeks, we got this nice uh, pre-post difference in defeatist beliefs. So this was the target mechanism. And if you change defeatist beliefs, you assume you're gonna change negative symptoms in experimental therapeutics program. This was the, the target. We had to move it at 0.5 to move to an RCT, which we did. And it's looking like you get a lot of signal by 18 weeks, you might not have to go all 24. And this is negative symptoms, um, same kind of thing, where you get some signal here, a, a large effect size by 18 weeks, not much gain for going longer. So you get some nice signal at 18 weeks, maybe an 18 week is, is a good intervention to do. Now circling back, I told you about pupillometry. So we added into this, well, what if we had a good biomarker of motivation? That would be very cool. So you could do pupillometry to measure how much effort people put into something Presumably, people who try harder are more motivated. So we threw pupillometry in here to test it as a biomarker of negative symptoms and motivation and change um, in that. So by 18 weeks, which was where we saw change in defeatist attitudes and where we saw a big change in negative symptoms and motivation on the scales, we get bigger pupil dilation at week 18 than week 24. So during the, they're just doing a digit span task. So they're, they're hearing six digits and you're recording their pupil while they try to remember six digits. 
Um, it's pretty easy to do, and it's looking like we have objective measures now of increased effort over the as negative symptoms go down. So maybe we have a biomarker of motivation. Just to round that off, this is people doing the digit span task in another study where we measured defeatist attitudes and pupillary responses during the digits task. This is healthy controls. This is two groups of people with schizophrenia, and this is a third group. This group has severe defeatist attitudes. These two groups have moderate or low defeatist attitudes. So you can see that people with higher DPOS scores try less on the digit span task than people with low DPOS scores. This just shows them in three, six, and nine digits. These are the severe attitudes. These are the not severe attitudes. So when the, when the load gets around the amount that you could do if you tried, maybe, everyone can do three, no one can do nine. Around here is where you really see the separation when you're right at capacity. When the going gets tough, the defeated get going. They don't go. They stop going. It's not a good metaphor. I'll work on it. But... <laughs> and it also maps on to negative symptoms. Interestingly, both kinds, expression and motivation, the more your attitudes are defeatist, the more you have negative symptoms. So full circle, attitudes, motivation, effort, pupil biomarker, maybe it's working as a measure of all these things. So to conclude this, um, we got significant reductions at 18 weeks with nice effect sizes. Um, in prior trials, we got D is 0.3 at 18 weeks. We didn't get nine till 36 weeks. So we're kind of, maybe the app is helping us get bigger effect sizes in half the time. Um, but I will caution, there's no control condition in this. This is just pre-post. Everyone came in really high. Regression to mean is going to give us some effect size. So the next step, and we're doing it now, is to have a supportive contact control condition. They also have, con they, everyone gets an iPhone and can do whatever they want with it. A lot of people never had a phone before and they're using it for YouTube, they listen to music, they call and text and get in touch with people. So just maybe just having a phone is cool enough and you don't have to do CBT on it, but we'll find out in the next RCT. So blended care could re reduce the implementation burden if you can do half the sessions and the therapist can start with a whole bunch of more people and get twice as many people seen. And pupillary responses might provide a good biomarker of um, motivation which and effort, which is something we're struggling in the field to have good measures of. So with that, I'll say thank you, and I saved 10 minutes for discussion, amazingly on time, which is very unlike me. And I'd like to thank all these people who, every one of them had some touch on everything that I told you about. So thank you. Thanks for a, a terrific talk. Um, how, in your trial, uh, were you able to find that the people who had a decrease in, in defeatist beliefs and you know improvement in negative symptoms, what happened? Did they go into the community and did they actually do things? I mean, I mean could you measure? Um, objective improvement in sort of what they did and in, in, in the real measures of functioning? Well, we had the ILSS as our measure of functioning, so they're reporting what they're doing in the community. Mm -hmm. So we have that self-report measure, but we also did measure objective indicators, as people call them, like did they go enroll in a class, did they work, um, did they live independent, move out of their boarding care? Those things are really hard to move because it takes a while to get a job or enroll in a class and get your own apartment. Um, but we actually did see um, in the younger, some of the trials I showed you, they were a little older, some they were a little younger. And in the, in the middle age range people, not the geriatric people, we saw movement on those objective indicators uh, as well. Haven't done it yet in the first episode, although we just finished the trial with ultra high risk. I think we might get more movement on those things there. Dr. Strober. Thank you, Eric. In the trials that you've done, is there any <clears throat> reason to believe that CBSST favorably impacts anhedonia 
And is there a relationship between a reduction in defeatist beliefs and anhedonia? Uh, I haven't used a specific anhedonia scale, um, but to the extent there's overlap between that and motivation, and which involves how much pleasure do you get. Some of the measures ask how much pleasure are you getting out of social activities and things. Um, to the extent there's overlap, we're getting signal on the relationship between that. Um, but not in, um, I haven't, I've never used like a specific anhedonia scale. I have used um, measures on EMA, where when people just had a social interaction, I've asked how much pleasure did you get in the interaction? How successful did you think it was? How well did it go? And those, those measures are um, very highly correlated with defeatist attitudes in the lab. I don't have pre-post data on that, but I have cross-sectional data that your DPOS correlates with that above like 0.6. Like what people say on the phone about their recent social interactions is very highly correlated with the DPOS scale. Um, I just want to be clear. The people in, this, in, in the studies have all been on medication, and you did not use anybody in the studies who have active hallucinations and delusions. Is that correct? So that's a good question. Um, uh, the, the first studies, the six trials I told you about, or I told you about four of the six trials of CBSST versus various control groups, those people, uh, those trials had virtually no exclusion criteria, so you didn't have to be taking medications. Anybody who came and said they wanted to be in that trial and they met diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder was in that trial. Even if they had active substance use, they, it was an effectiveness approach. And so everybody was in those trials. Um, they weren't excluded for high positive, and there was, there was virtually no, you had to just be able to function as an outpatient in a group. Um, in the last trial with the app, cbt to go plus the mcbt n trial, that was the only one where there was all those exclusion criteria. That criteria. Um, I no, I don't usually uh, work on positive symptoms because positive symptoms are highly correlated with. Um, I'm trying to improve recovery outcomes, so living, learning, working, and socializing is what um, John McQuaid and I developed CBSST to target that. It turned out it worked through attitudes and, and negative symptoms, but we were always trying to set living, learning, working, and socializing goals and have people achieve those. So if hallucinations are in the way, like if a voice is saying, don't go on the bus when someone's trying to go to their job interview, we'll go after hallucinations like the power of the voice, and if the voice is saying, go on the bus and I'll hurt you, we'll go after those beliefs and say, how do you know the voice is gonna hurt you? Maybe you should, you should test it out. You, know, you might be able to go on the bus, you're giving up your job over the voice and you don't even know if it's true. So we'll, we'll work on beliefs about voices, but only if they're in the way of the functioning. Just because someone has voices, we don't treat voices. If someone's got a delusion, we don't treat the delusion unless it's interfering with the stated long-term goal, and then we'll treat it. David, yeah. Oh, hi, Dave. <laughs> really enjoyed your talk. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about social cognition, whether social cognition is a moderator of response to these treatments? Um, no. <laughs> Feel free to conjecture. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> no, just your um, we, your clinical experience is fine. <laughs> we we have not done a lot of work with moderators. I've looked at a few. Um, I did have some theory of mind measures in some of these studies, and that did not moderate. Um, and it's highly correlated with um, other like global neurocognitive abilities. In every study, since I'm a neuropsychologist in recovery, I have uh, had neuropsych batteries at baseline and on the way. And in those studies, very interestingly, neuropsych, aim two of every grant I ever wrote um, till it stopped being true, finding it was true, was that neuropsych would moderate. Like people with, who can't remember or problem solve, they must do badly in interventions where you have to learn stuff and test out beliefs and hypothesis tests. Turned out to be completely not true. In fact, 
People with worse executive functions do better in CBSST than people with good executive functions. And so we, in my lab, we call that the Granholm curse, where you find significant effects in the opposite direction. It's not just not finding it, it's like really wrong. It's in the opposite direction. And my post hoc interpretation is that if you can figure out stuff on your own, you probably will. But if you can't, it helps to have someone teach you the three C's or to teach you scale on how to solve problems and provide these compensatory strategies that help you figure out stuff with, because you don't have your executive functions to help you figure it out. It, it's, initially, it was global neuropsych. When we drilled down, it turned out to be mostly the executive functions that actually predicted, poor executive functions actually predicted better outcome. So to the extent those are related to social cognitive abilities, I would predict that social cognitive abilities wouldn't moderate. And if they do, if you're bad at those things, you might actually do better in these interventions. Um, so that was important in data for psychiatrists who don't refer people to me. And I said, why don't you, why don't you refer someone to my program? And they say, well, she's really impaired. She can never do CBT. And I'm like, that's exactly who should do CBT. In fact, everything we found is like, if you have severe defeatist attitudes, those people have 1.2 effect size in CBSST. So if you don't have bad attitudes, you don't actually get that much better. And so it kind of is saying, well, if you have an intervention, it presumably works because it targets defeatist attitudes. If you don't have those, you don't need the intervention. You know, if you have good executive abilities, maybe you don't need these compensatory, you don't need a therapist to teach you how to do this stuff. So it's paradoxical sometimes. Okay, we're right at the top of the hour. Thanks very much, Aaron. Thanks, everyone.